Hello there, beer nerds. This is the Beer by the Numbers podcast, the only educational podcast that encourages you to consume beer while you listen. I'm your host, Ryan, and I'm so happy to be bringing you this, the inaugural episode of the Beer by the Numbers podcast. You know, I'm especially excited today because in this first episode, I finally get to cover a topic that I've wanted to cover for a while, the three-tiered distribution system for beer that exists here in the United States today. And you know, ever since I started the Beer by the Numbers YouTube channel, I wanted to do a deep dive into the history behind this system because not only does it combine really nerdy stuff like politics and economics with beer, but it also forms the backbone of how brewers and drinkers interact in the world's second largest beer market. So I just want to dive right in by answering the most obvious question here. What is the three-tiered distribution system beer is subject to here in the U.S.? Well, to put it simply, it's the legally defined way beer takes from the brewer to the drinker. You know, you start with the first tier, which is the brewer. Someone who lovingly crafts delicious brews for all of us to drink. You know, they put a ton of time and energy and love into each and every one of those brews. And then they take them and sell them to the second tier, a distributor. You know, while I was researching this, I I really found that distributors can actually take a lot of different forms. Most move beer around, but some distributors are importers and others are government agencies called control boards. It's at this second tier that a lot of regulatory checks also happen before they sell beer again to the third tier, which is the retailer. Retailers are the most varied by far. You have everything from your local bottle shops to large billion dollar restaurant chains and even your small mom and pop local dive bar. This is where the final sale to the drinker happens, but it's also where the regulations around who can buy beer and how much come into play. Now you've probably already thought through a couple exceptions to the system already. Most commonly is heading to your local craft brewery tap room and buying directly from them. Just hold your horses on that, we're going to get to these exceptions in due time. But at the end of the day, a vast majority of beer sold in this country flows through all three tiers of these systems. So I guess the the next kind of question I had while I was researching was how in the world did such a system become standard in the first place? I think a lot of the time when we talk about history, we're very matter of fact about things. You know, first A happened, which led to B, and then that followed up with C. But we don't often think about all of the context and the crazy amount of argumentation that surrounds these events. You know, kind of like the U.S. entering World War I. You know, oftentimes in school we're explained the reasons why, but almost never do we hear about things like the huge protests and the action sparked by the U.S. entering World War I and the fiery speeches and all the controversy that was drawn up in the legislature against it. And you know, one of the goals I have with this program is to make sure you understand that context when it comes to beer and you get a feel for the controversy and you know how close things were to going in a completely different direction when it comes to beer history. So in order to capture all that context today, I want to take us way back before these systems even came into play, way back before prohibition here in the U.S., so we can understand why the U.S. government set into motion the events that would lead to this three-tiered model. I'm pretty sure everyone has seen an old Western movie, and in those movies, you know, you'd see the hero walk into the local saloon, and in there you would see all sorts of sordid activities going on. Well, that was a lot closer to reality than you might think in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Old school saloons were still around even then, and they served all types of degenerates. You know, they would have men that are way too drunk, Uh, You'd have all matter of whores and prostitutes, gambling in there, a lot of men fighting, and they were really a bit of a caricature of themselves. 
As you might imagine, such places would get a pretty bad rap, and alcohol was largely seen as one of the main instigating factor in all these vices. Or at least it was very central to all of them going on. And it wasn't just these crazy saloons that dotted the countryside that were creating this controversy either. There was the most common drinking establishment at the time, Tide Houses, and they had more than their fair share of problems. For those of you that don't know what a Tide House is, it's a bar that only serves beer or booze from one brewery or distillery. Oftentimes, the alcohol producer owns, or at least has partial ownership, in a Tide House. Hence the name, because the two are tied together. Now, in the modern context of tap rooms, you might wonder why these places were so bad. Well, imagine for a moment that you run a small brewery in an era where you can only distribute as far as a horse can haul all your beer. No big open markets, no refrigerations, no beer trucks, no beer tourism, and not many bottle shops that carry a wide variety of brands. So if you want to actually make money on beer, which is a pretty low margin product, you're not going to get a lot of profit only selling a little bit of beer you have to make sure you sell a lot of beer to the very limited crowd that you have access to. And that incentivizes the Tide House that you might own to overserve every single person that comes in the door. Because every mug of beer someone doesn't buy is a step closer to bankruptcy for you. So you have these saloons that are basically dens of infamy and tied houses whose business model is getting people as drunk as possible and you can probably see how alcohol is going to get a bad rap. Especially in an era when topics like domestic abuse were largely tolerated, much less openly discussed and debated against. So now you see why many in the US began to cry out to their legislatures to take some action and they took some pretty extreme action. Many states began banning alcohol outright. Fun fact, the first state to try prohibition in the United States was Maine in 1851. Over the next 60 years, prohibition movements escalated from local to state and eventually to the federal government, culminating in 1920 with the 18th Amendment to the Constitution which outlawed the production, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages. Now, I'm not going to do it a really deep dive into Prohibition America here, but the next 13 years while Prohibition was in effect really proved that just banning something people really want won't really solve any of the problems that you set out to solve in the first place. Prohibition led to the rise of figures like Al Capone and violence in the streets with rival gangs in cities warring over territory as they fought, shooting machine guns and killing many different people. Not surprisingly, many of the old vices that were in saloons moved straight into speakeasies, especially gambling, and a lack of regulation led to some alcoholic beverages being rather unsafe for consumption. Needless to say, a spike in violent crime and extremely well-armed criminal enterprises led to prohibition laws not being well enforced anyway. No police officer wants to run into a speakeasy and get gunned down after all. So 13 years later, Congress ended the nationwide prohibition by passing the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, which coincidentally is my favorite amendment to the Constitution. Now the nation had a bit of a problem though. If a heavy-handed ban on alcohol didn't solve the problems saloons and tide houses created, how in the world were they going to solve them going forward? So the federal legislature decided that they would pass the buck, and after all they were pretty unpopular for passing prohibition in the first place, so they decided to leave it up to each state to determine how they want to control alcohol. And many of those states were pretty eager to take on the task, mostly because they saw it as a huge opportunity to levy some new tax streams using a newly legal industry. Both these concerns led many states to divide a three-tiered distribution system, where ownership in all three stages, production, distribution, and retail, 
was illegal. Now it's easy to draw parallels of prohibition and the beginning era of post-prohibition America to drugs like marijuana today, but as we're going to see, this system became very complicated because of the problems it was trying to solve beforehand. I know a lot of people like to just point to the prohibition on alcohol and say, see, I can't believe we still let weed be legal. Look at all the problems we had with alcohol prohibition. But look, the problems that Congress was trying to solve with alcohol at the time are very different than what the anti-weed lobby was trying to solve at the time. So just pointing back at history and saying, look, here's an example that supports legalization, I'm not so sure entirely holds up water. Now many legislatures and regulators designed these systems in the new three-tiered way because they felt it provides a system of checks and balances in the beer industry supply chains. Now I know they just stole that moniker from the checks and balances we all learn about in terms of the three branches of government, but let's take a look at some of that reasoning that they came up with now. Starting with the first tier, the brewer, they are responsible for producing the product and besides making a great product, they are responsible for following all food and drink regulations as well. This tier allowed legislatures to mitigate the problem of inconsistent quality in alcoholic beverage as well as the sometimes unsafe cocktails that ended up making their way into speakeasies or in the pre-prohibition market. The brewer then sells their beer to the second tier, a distributor, and they are responsible for ensuring actually quite a lot of things. They do labeling laws and make sure that all the government warnings are on every product that gets sold. They also ensure that they sell beer to only licensed retailers or bars. And speaking of which, the retailer or bar is responsible for controlling who can buy the alcohol. They ensure that drinkers are of the legal age, and trust me, if you do not ensure that drinkers are of the legal age, you are going to get shut down, and they're also responsible for not over-serving their customers. This was to try to stop the Tide House model, where a brewer had a big incentive to over-serve a customer because they made a lot more money. Now if you over-serve customers or serve underage customers, you're likely to get booted right out of the industry. Many people see the three-tiered system as pretty essential to ensuring that all the controls put in place regarding alcohol are followed. For example, an old school Tide House had the incentive to keep selling you beer no matter how drunk you got, whereas a modern bar could easily lose their license for doing that. Another incentive the government has in maintaining the three-tiered model is that it generates more revenue in taxes, as each tier has their own tax to pay when they sell the beer. The brewer pays the federal excise tax. This is due on every barrel or every set of bottles they sell to a distributor and is seen more as a tax on production rather than the actual sale of beer. The distributor or alcohol control board or importer pays whatever state or local excises taxes may be in place when they sell beers into bars and bottle shops. And finally, the bars or liquor stores transaction with the consumer includes the retail sales tax for state and local governments. Now regardless of what you think about taxation and how high it is on beer, here in the United States, the average is about 40% of a beer cost is tax. It's pretty obvious that the more steps there are between the brewer and the consumer, the more taxes governments get on every level. Now, if you're like me, you kind of have a critical mind about a lot of this stuff, and you're probably already thinking some problems this system might introduce. Well, there have been plenty of people arguing against this system ever since it was put into place. So I'm going to go over some of the arguments here, but if you really want to do a deep dive, there are just so many out there if you look them up. I think the first main argument is, is that if you're a small brewery looking to break into this system, it can be really hard 
You know, not only do you need to develop new relationships with drinkers, getting them to try your beer, getting them to like your beer, getting them to tell other people about your beer, but you also have to get through a pitch with a distributor before any of that can even happen most of the time. And it can also make your product pretty expensive. After all, the product's going to get marked up and taxed three times on its way to the consumer. I actually think this argument that the three-tiered distribution system is biased against small brewers is the one that is most borne out by reality in the United States. Ever since the three-tiered system started getting implemented in the 1930s, the U.S. had been dominated by mega brewing corporations for like 70 years and it really killed the local brewing tradition. And this was the case until a few small brewers managed to overcome the system and grow big enough to begin lobbying to open the market up to exceptions. And I really think that this argument is pretty legitimate. After all, you don't come to have three beers dominate 90% of the market without a nice system in place. The second big argument I found against the three-tiered system is that all the steps really drive up beer prices. If you spend a little bit of time thinking about this system, you realize that there are a lot of opportunities for markups. At least three people, the brewer, the distributor, and the retailer, all mark up the product over its original costs, as opposed to something like a taproom, where only the brewery gets to mark it up. And not only does this lead to higher prices for the consumers, but it also really favors those brewers that have huge economies of scale and cut costs by making crappier beer. Again, that's why we saw three mega brewers come to dominate the market. Finally, for a system that is designed to prevent one entity from dominating more than one of the three tiers, it's been pretty clear that the mega brewing conglomerates have been able to dominate regardless. If you've ever read a headline about something called a pay to play scheme, it's basically when one brewing company pays a distributor in an area for special privileges. Say I live in a rural part of the country. There's only one beer distributor that's going to bother to drive beer out to where I live. And if AB InBev comes in and says, hey, I'm going to give you a little bit of a cash rebate if you only carry my beers, well, I, the consumer, am only going to see a few select beers out by me. And let's not forget that all the free things that distributors and brewers give away to bars for special access. Of course you've walked into a bar and seen a ton of beer paraphernalia, whether it's on the bar rails, hung up on the walls, all promoting specific brands. Well, almost all of that is given away for free. And that also influences drinkers' decisions. Despite these three big arguments against the three tiered system, there are still many proponents of the system today. It does accomplish things like ensuring breweries don't have an incentive to overserve their patrons, although it seems that craft beer drinkers in tap rooms have become some of the most responsible drinkers out there statistically. It still seems like dive bars and other places that are really dominated by big brewers still have a lot of problems with overserving patrons and things like drunk driving. Whereas the craft beer industry does see statistically significantly less of those two behaviors. And it does definitely ensure Uncle Sam gets his due through taxes in most areas of the country. And like I said, the final cost of a beer is about 40% tax. But I don't think I'm going to dive headlong into the wolves on that one. But beyond those things, many argue that the laws and regulations actually represent one of the cheapest ways of ensuring that taxes are collected and regulations are abided by. And you know, as much as we are a pretty faithful nation in the free market here, this might actually be right. There is one state in the union that doesn't require their breweries to go through the three-tiered process. Washington. In Washington state, a brewer can negotiate directly with a liquor store on prices and volume without having to work through a distributor. And yet, a vast majority of the beer in the state still runs through all three tiers of the process, despite the freedom of the market to take whatever form it likes. 
In addition, even though distributors are sometimes painted as greedy middlemen, they also offer a lot of services to small brewers, like not needing to have your own trucking fleet to get your beer out there, or not having to negotiate with a large book of customers and dealing with all the customer service aspects. Finding the right distribution partner can help your brewery take off really quickly if you make good deals and you play your cards right. Now as many of you know there are plenty of exceptions being incorporated into this process, most commonly for tap rooms at small breweries. Many politicians have seen the benefit of allowing breweries to sell directly to us consumers. After all, independent brewers now add about 600,000 jobs to the US economy and spur local production and even new industries like beer tourism. The craft beer renaissance really has shown that allowing brewers some flexibility can really have great impacts on local economies. It's hard to describe all the exceptions that exist in the US today as laws are created on the state and local level. For example, here in Minnesota where I live, we finally allowed bottle shops and liquor stores to be open on Sundays just last year. Never mind what all the different taxes look like or how much beer you can even sell in your tap room before extra fees. One specific example I do want to share with you though is from Texas, and I did a video about this a while back on the Beer by the Numbers YouTube channel. Basically there was a proposed law that if your tap room sold over a certain amount of beer, I think it was 80,000 barrels a year you would be required to sell any additional beer to a distributor and then buy it back from them again before you could sell it in your tap room. Now this has to be one of the stupidest ideas ever because guess what? The distributor never even touches the product. You're literally paying someone to sell beer to you that you have already made and that you have already got in the place that you want to sell it. Now obviously the Texas legislators were trying to prevent distributors from going out of business to keep a healthy competition amongst distributors so we didn't have a lot of distribution monopolies in certain areas. And with the growing popularity of tap rooms, distribution monopolies are becoming more and more common as distributors get less of the market's volume. But come on guys, you can't just let get distributors get paid for doing absolutely nothing. That makes no sense. Finally, it seems like the number of exceptions keeps on growing, and the more it grows, the less relevant the three-tiered distribution model is becoming. Going forward, it's likely that we're going to continue to see the marketplace of beer evolve. I for one am really, really interested to see how technology is going to change everything especially the distribution and sale of beer. You know, we've got big players like Amazon trying to enter the market and small players like the myriad of beer delivery startups that are popping up in craft beer loving cities across the country. It is going to be really, really interesting to see how all the laws interplay with all these companies. That's for sure. So hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me for this, the first episode of the Beer by the Numbers podcast. You know, I'm just a nerd who is really, really passionate about beer, and I wanted to share that passion with as many people as I possibly can. I think oftentimes beer is looked down on as kind of a low-class drink. And although I think the craft beer industry is doing a really good job of shattering this perception, I want to make sure this isn't some passing fad by creating a community of excited and passionate beer fans who have a love for learning about beer. If you want to join me in this mission, check out the links in the description below and head over to the Beer by the Numbers Facebook fan page. Let me know you're a listener and I'll let you into the group. Sorry I have to do this little extra step, but want to make sure it's full of just passionate people and not spam bots. Over there, we're building a community of passionate beer lovers, and I'm sure you're going to appreciate all the discussion happening there. And if you haven't been to the Beer by the Numbers YouTube channel, what in the world are you waiting for? I have two years worth of a back catalog of beer videos there. Now before I go, it's time for our nightcap numbers related to today's episode. 
And for episode number one, I have decided to take a quick look at the world's number one beer market, China. In a world where beer sales in many markets are beginning to slow, China is growing strong. Over the past five years, beer consumption has increased by 17%, and craft beer volumes have boomed by 25%. Crazy. Qingdao is China's most iconic beer, and the brewery was actually originally a joint venture between Britain and Germany, meant to satisfy the thirst of their soldiers and merchants they were constantly sending to the area. And finally, a cool story out of the Chinese beer market. A clever Chinese beer distributor once made a huge magazine ad campaign for P Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, advertising it as a superior spirit that was enjoyed in champagne flutes over in the West. The ads worked great, and for a few months, that distributor was able to sell bottles of Pabst Blue Ribbon for $40 each to quite a few different customers. That was until they realized this brew was not regarded with such applaud in the West. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next time with more great beer content. Cheers.